So here's what the richest and wisest king who ever lived said about success, money, and life. Remember in the movie Gladiator, where Russell Crowe was playing the Roman general, and what he said to his troops before going into combat? Here's what he said. What we do in life echoes in eternity. So today, we're beginning a 12-part series into Ecclesiastes. Now, for some of you who came around the Seven Figure Squad Scripture series, we broke down here the 31 chapters of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs in the Bible was written by King Solomon, and King Solomon rose to power and gave the people of Israel 40 years of prosperity, wealth, happiness, and joy in one of the most exciting times in the history of Israel. Now, his next book that he wrote in the Bible was called Ecclesiastes, is written from a different perspective, completely different from my experience and our experience together going through the book of Proverbs. In my opinion, when I'm reading Ecclesiastes, I see King Solomon desperate in his language, with no praise or peace, even suggesting questionable conduct opposite of what he wrote in Proverbs. Let's break down again. Who was King Solomon, who's regarded as the richest and wisest king who ever lived? Oftentimes I get pushback saying, oh, Matt, no, it wasn't King Solomon who was the wisest and richest king. It was Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa, well, according to research we've done, was worth $400 billion, a massive amount of money, especially during that time. But how did Mansa Musa lose his money? He lost his money by simply giving his money away and devaluing the value of the gold that he had because he gave a lot of his wealth away, therefore making him sadly poor before he died. Now, King Solomon, completely opposite. He was worth, in today's money, over $2.1 trillion dollars of wealth. And how did he die? And how did he go out after living a life of wealth, prosperity, excitement, and happiness not only for himself, but everybody around him? King Solomon, his downfall was marrying women from foreign gods, and he was praising and worshiping other gods, and God got pissed off at him. So we read a scripture in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5, that at 20 years old, God came to Solomon in his dreams, asking him, what do you need from me? In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And you think, what would you want at 20 years old? Think about this. You're 20 years old. You're about to be in charge of country. You have everything at your feet. What would you ask for at 20 years old? Is it more money? Is it a bigger army? Is it bigger land, provisions, new territories, new countries? What would you ask God if you were 20 years old? King Solomon requested, as Scripture says in 1 Kings chapter 3, it reads like this. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Now, does that answer just blow your mind away? So what King Solomon asked for, asked for money, he asked for women, he asked for party time, he asked for drinks, he asked for cigars, you know what he asked for? Discernment, wisdom. And here's how God responded. It says here in scripture, 1 Kings chapter 3, 11 through 14. God said to him, since you have asked for this, not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administrating justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be after you. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. So do you think King Solomon followed through with that part in terms of following God and making sure you stay aligned, you stay equipped, you stay strong? You think he followed that? Short answer, no, he didn't. So here's my big takeaway from Ecclesiastes chapter one. As I'm reading through Ecclesiastes, the first thing I noticed about King Solomon in his writings is this. He's definitely not preaching the gospel. He's writing this from a weird and even sometimes a conflicting position. It's based upon what he's about to write here in scripture. It goes in contrast, uh, sometimes even in conflict, with what he wrote in Proverbs. In some of your toughest, darkest moments, in some of your most vulnerable moments, what do you ask God? Well, we find King Solomon here in that very position. He's questioning God himself. He's questioning the existence of God. He's questioning the meaning of God. He was even questioning his relationship with God. And then a revelation comes to him and says, you know what? Maybe I need to look at life through a much different lens, from a much different perspective. What was that perspective? From an eternal, God-centered perspective. Not from the throne, but from a God-centered, eternal perspective. Interesting. He writes here in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, verse 2 through 4. 
Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and go, but the earth remains forever. So do you ever think about what your life is going to look like? Remember when I was 20 years old? Remember when I was 30 years old? I thought I knew everything. You've heard me often say, I've taken my 30s to repay the mistakes in my 20s. I was a single father. I got divorced. I went through bankruptcy. I went through single dad, single baby mama drama, all that crud that uh, sadly a lot of former military veterans go through. Why? Because we're unequipped with the knowledge, the wisdom, the education, the awareness of picking the wrong relationship, the wrong spouse or wrong person to have a kid with. And guess what? I'd paid it for a very, very long time. It wasn't until my 40s that I started to experience a little bit of stride in terms of getting ahead. But with that being said, when you are finally on your deathbed, what do you say to yourself? What do you ask yourself when you look back on your life and ask yourself these questions? What was it all for? Did I give it my all? Or do you have one of these five biggest regrets that people experience on the deathbed? I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I wish that I hadn't let myself be happier. Sometimes we all get caught up in the now for decades. And then when you finally ask yourself, what was it all for? When they're finally putting you in the ground, what are they saying about you? What does your body of work of your life say about you? The people that show up to your funeral, that take time, either day, their lives, their families, their jobs, their businesses, to come to your funeral. What does that say about you? What was it that you stood for? And also, you're looking back, what do I have to show for? How many people's lives are improved or enriched or have gotten better because of their association directly and indirectly with you? Did you make an impact on God's kingdom based on your talents, your opportunities, and the lessons you learned in your life? My second biggest takeaway here from Ecclesiastes chapter one is also a sense of cynicism, a little bit cynical in his delivery of my interpretation of when he's writing the scriptures. Let's check it out. In Ecclesiastes chapter one, eight through 11, it reads like this. All things are wearisome more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is full of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new created under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations. And even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who followed them. Well, King Solomon, I just want you to know, from your bloodline, from your father's bloodline, all the way from Abraham and after you, 41, 42 generations total, came our Savior, Jesus Christ. So my friend, my King Solomon, generations do remember you. So this is why I'm talking about cynicism. I don't know the type of state of mind he was in. All I can assume is that he was in a moment of desperation, maybe might be pissed off a little bit about what happened to his life, but Proverbs was written from his prime. From 20 years old, his rise to power, his elevation of Israel to a season of 40 years of wealth, wisdom, happiness, and enjoyment. People were just having a blast under his reign. Now, those days are far gone. How much do you learn about yourself and the people that you have in your life? Not during the good times, but do you learn about people more during the bad times? That's where real character shows up. And how many times have you been in a time in a position of frustration? You're asking yourself, all for what? Also, for those days that King Solomon says, you know what, nothing new is created under the sun. And some of us think, these are very unique times. We've never experienced this craziness going on in the world. What did King Solomon just say here in scripture? Nothing new is created under the sun. It's new to you because you've never experienced it before. But history has a tendency to repeat itself. Why? Because we're humans. Whether it's biblical days, whether it be the Renaissance days, whether it be World War I, World War II, or this current postmodern era, nothing new is created under the sun. As people often ask, Matt, why do you follow the Bible? Because to me, if I'm going through the situation of what happened today, it happened 400 years ago, it happened 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years during these biblical eras, and I have this manual called the Bible, well, guess what I have now? I have a pattern of values and principles that I should consider following to go through and navigate through some of the most difficult times of my life as an entrepreneur, as a father, and as a husband. These are the values and principles that have led to success, having a God-centered viewpoint on the world that I as a dad, I as a leader of my community, I as a leader of my home, should consider adopting when I have times of conflict and I don't know exactly the decision I need to make. And that's what the Bible is for me. Yes, it's, of course it's a relationship with God, 
I've now got a manual of experiences and the lessons learned, what I should do and what I should avoid. So if you're looking for a resource, looking for a manual of wins and losses, looking for a word, that's why the Bible is called the living word. Well, guess what? That's what the Bible provides myself and all of the believers in the world. My third big lesson from Ecclesiastes chapter one is that our actions will always have consequences, good or bad. Our actions will always have a reaction. Ecclesiastes chapter one, 16 through 18, it reads like this. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ever ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly, but I learned that this too is as chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Kind of sounds like B.I.G., right? The more money you make, the more problems you get. So keep this in mind. At this point where King Solomon is writing this, in my opinion, obviously I would love your feedback on this too as well. That King Solomon has drifted away from God. King Solomon right now is dealing with the consequences of being unaligned with God. You can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 11 because King Solomon began to love and marry women that worshiped pagan gods, not God, but pagan gods, false gods, and that pissed off God. That being said, God is a patient God. God is a merciful God. Instead of bringing down hellfire and fear upon King Solomon, he gave him two chances. He said, King Solomon, get your together twice. And I don't know, King Solomon could have been at a party, drinking it up, got his girls next to him, lighting it up, buzzed, whatever the case would be. He was having his own way, not God's way, his own way. Sad part is, remember, when there's an action, there's a reaction, what did God do? After two more chances, God turned away from him. The sad part about this is that Israel will then start to begin its decline. We always have a saying that your obedience to your purpose, your calling, brings blessings to your home and everybody around you. Well, guess what King Solomon stopped doing? He stopped obedience, stopped listening to that calling. He wasn't using wisdom that he prayed for. And guess what? Everybody is now paying the consequences of his lack of discretion and staying aligned to his promises and his relationship with God. Why? Because King Solomon is a leader. And as a leader, you raise the level for yourself and everybody around you, but also at the same time too as well. If you don't lead and you decide to be passive, this is what happens. Everybody around you now starts paying the price for your lack of discretion. Remember this, your alignment determines your assignment. You're in alignment, great things come your way. You're out of alignment, bad things come your way. And now we're hearing it in his words in scripture, that King Salma is in somewhat of a meaningless, desperate type of situation. And he's got a big feeling of regret for surrounding himself with the wrong people. And obviously surrounding himself with the wrong women. Because as the chain of events starts to unfold, a royal family also turns himself away from King Salma. All these events starts leading to another, not for the good, but for the worse of Israel. And his kingdom now starts to implode. But God said, listen, man, I got to leave one tribe for King Solomon. I promised that to his dad, King David, because God still needed to preserve this bloodline, this tribe, which will eventually lead to Jesus, as we will read in the New Testament. And when I read that, I'm also looking at this stuff like, you know what? Of all the screw-ups, is you're going to read, if you read the Bible, the different characters, the prostitutes, uh, the addicts, the people that are angry, the temperaments, the murderers, this bloodline. These 41, 42 generations leading from Abraham to Jesus, God used some of the worst people to bring a savior to this earth. And when you're looking at your life, you say, Matt, Matt, what's good about my life? I don't know, that's between you and God. All I know is God doesn't create mistakes. There has got to be some purpose. There's got to be a talent. There's got to be some use for you to be here on this earth. And it's your job to go out there and discover that, to discover your talents, to discover those relationships, to discover what your meaning of life is, what your purpose is. What they're saying is, two greatest days of a man's life is, num is number one, the day he was born, and number two, the day he realizes why he was born. God has made you for a time such as this, especially what our country is going through right now, what America is going through right now. So I hope you start looking at things differently, not from a position of desperation, being too short-term focused, being in crisis mode, scarcity only for the here and now, but I hope you look at things from an eternal purpose. I'll give you an example. Uh, somebody was asking me, Matt, how come you're so dedicated to social media content and creating YouTube? You know why? Here's why. Of course, I love the Seven Figure Squad audience. I appreciate you for helping us build it to 300,000 plus subs. But here's the thing too as well. You know what I'm really building this for? For my great, great, great grandkids. 
at some time in 2100, the year of our Lord, the turn of the century, that my five-year-old, my 10-year-old, my 20-year-old, great, great, great grandchild has got a bug of entrepreneurship in his heart and his spirit. He wants to go out there and take on the world. He wants to make a name for himself and he's gonna look back on my YouTube videos, Seven Figure Squad, and say, wow, that's what my great-great-grandfather, Matthew, looked like at 49 years old as an entrepreneur. He was only making seven figures. He, was a, he wasn't a billionaire. We're a billionaire family, but this is what it looked like. Why? Because I believe that every generation has this great decision to make to improve the bloodline of that family. My parents did it. What I do, they went from being immigrants from the Philippines to build a better life for us here in America. And here's the thing. I don't know about my, my grandparents. I definitely don't know about my great-grandparents or my great-great-grandparents. And I believe I'm here to provide them as they're looking down upon my life from the heavens above that I'm going to be my ancestors' wildest dreams come true. And the same for you. You are your ancestors' wildest dreams. Think about this. If you go back to your lineage, if you go back to, if you went back to the DVD and the lineage of your life, if you saw a movie, what your parents went through, your grandparents, blah, 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 all right? Let's say three, four, five generations before you. What did they go through? What did your DNA fight through to make sure that you are here today? So yes, King Solomon says, life is all meaningless. If you're only looking from a nine to five perspective, if you're looking at it from a commissions to a commissions perspective, if you're only looking from a monetary, I want to be a millionaire perspective, and I want to live in this neighborhood and drive this car perspective, you're right. Life is meaningless. All that crap doesn't mean anything. You'll get bored very quickly. But if you look at life from the perspective of what does God want to do with me? What does my mark in eternity mean that my obedience to that calling, that purpose is going to send a ripple effect to the descendants after me? Man, I'm, that jacks me up. I'm fired about that. I'm excited to meet the version of me that gives birth to that generation. That it's not a leaving an inheritance to my next generation, but I leave in my next generation through use of social media, these videos. Obviously, the inheritance of the trust fund I'm able to establish for the very first time by becoming a first generation cash flow millionaire. And I'm paying this forward right now. I'm paying the price to pay it forward. And so can you. So as I wrap up, I pray that you honor all that God has given you in your life. No matter how big or small you think and insignificant you might think you are, of did you honor whatever it is that God presents your way. That is a follower of this channel, that we inspire you to greatness, to become a first generation cash flow millionaire because your family deserves better. Your family needs to be provided for. Your family needs to be protected. Your family's purpose needs to be found. That you're going to use your wealth, your status, your influence, your power, your notoriety to bring glory to God and let people know, man, who's still in charge, that God is still in the miracle business. So what do you think God is going to use you to do? Please put it in the comment section below. If you want to check out the 31 chapters of Proverbs, click this video right here. That being said, from Dallas, Texas, I'm your mighty smart guy, and until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be mighty smart today.